Welcome back, fifth grade. This is Mrs. Tarango with the Citizenship Academy. We're on Domain 5, Lesson 2, reading informational text for details of the early Renaissance. Our objectives for today are to describe the techniques and features of Renaissance art and architecture by quoting accurately from the text. We're going to gather information about the techniques and features by paraphrasing. We're going to use past tense to convey various times, sequences, states, and conditions, and we're going to read multisyllabic words with the prefixes M and N out of context. Some key vocabulary is accurately doing something free from mistakes. Describe to represent or give an account of in words. Explain is to make plain or understandable or to give the reason for or a cause of. Features, parts or details that stand out. Paraphrase, a way of stating something again by giving the meaning in different words. To quote is to repeat someone's words exactly. It also could mean to give an example of and to set off written material by quotation marks. And technique, a method of accomplishing a desired aim. You're now going to read the text independently. Feel free to pause the video at any time to read more thoroughly and do your best with unknown words. Okay, so now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be reading to learn about techniques and features of Renaissance art and architecture. So you're actually going to be able to go back and reread the chapter you just read, but this time when you go back and read it, you're going to look for those technique and features of Renaissance art um, and architecture and what made those special. So then you're going to complete the chart that's provided below and we're going to be working on quoting accurately from the text so when we quote accurately from the text we're pulling words exactly as they are written from the story so you're going to create a chart that's just like this on a separate piece of paper on the first column it should say technique or feature what technique or feature did you notice in the text that was special um, it could be a stat, you know, their statues, it could be their paintings, however, whichever one was interesting, I want you to pick at least two or three to, um, to figure out. And you're going to identify them in the first column. Your second column is quoting from the text. Where did it describe that feature or um, technique? And you're going to pull that, ta that quote exactly from the story. That means you're actually copying it directly from the story. Make sure you include those quotation marks that shows that you're pulling from the text um, at the beginning at the end of your quote. And then give me the page number that you found it on. Now you'll notice that I left that last column blank. You're going to leave that blank for now. We will fill this in. Just make sure you leave it blank just for now. And be sure to take the time to go through this story and find at least two or three techniques or features. So our word work for today is embodiment. In this strong, watchful warrior, the people of Florence must have seen the embodiment of their own spirit. An embodiment is someone or something that is visible representation or example of an idea or concept. This word is a noun. Okay. Now, in our vocabulary that we learned today we talked about paraphrasing paraphrasing means you're going to put your information in your own words the reason that we paraphrase things is because it helps our brains to decode something that we're reading and puts it into a way that's more understandable for us so it kind of breaks it down to be more reader friendly i guess uh so that's why we paraphrase the text now what you're going to do is you're going to paraphrase based on what you've created previously you in the previous part of this lesson you should have already reread the text and completed that chart with at least two or three features or techniques of the art and architecture that you read in the chapter then you were also supposed to quote specifically from the text to copy those words now what you're going to do and i'm going to go back a second you're going to use this last column to paraphrase so, for example, if I talked about the vanishing point, 
So I'm going to go back again. This is an example of a vanishing point. You'll notice how in this painting, it looks as if the road is ending. It's showing how the road is kind of closing off. And same thing with this painting. It shows that how the building kind of goes. I'm going to then pull a, a quote directly from that text. So when the lines come together, they seem to vanish. So this point is called the vanishing point. I can copy that directly from the text and put it here. I'm also going to put the page number, which is page 18. Now what I'm going to do is paraphrase it and put it into my own words. Well, there is a part of the painting where the where it seems to go to disappear, and that's a vanishing point. I'm explaining what a vanishing point is, not using the sentence that's provided. Now, this is kind of a hard sentence to change, but there was other examples of sentences that you could use that explain what a vanishing point is. But all we're wanting you to do is use the quote that you provide, you've chosen, and paraphrase it in your own words, which means it should not be an exact copy that you took from the text. So make sure you finish that. And you're going to want to keep this chart handy for future lessons, so make sure you hold on to it. So we're going to talk about subject linking agreement. So we're going to learn about what that is, but we're going to learn about it in the past tense. So what if I'm looking at something in the past, I'm not going to say I am or I what. I'm going to say I was. You're, you're not going to say you are, you were. So things these are words that show a past tense, meaning they've already happened. He, she, it, the Medici, um, Sarah, my dog, was. Uh, if we're talking about it plural, more than one person, we'd say we were, you were, they, the paintings were. So it's really important that we use um, the past tense and they all have to agree. What that means is I can't say I were. Um, that's not an agreement of between the subject and the linking verb. So it's really important that we use the correct linking verb. Now it's also kind of goes along with our senses because the senses kind of change it up a little bit. We wouldn't say I, f I feel filled it. I wouldn't say I um, look if I'm talking about the past tense, because that means it already happened. If I feel the wind on my face, that means that's happening right now. But I felt the wind on my face means something that happened in the previous time. So that's what I what we mean about um, subject link agreement. They have to make sense. If you're talking about something in the past, all of your verbs have to mean that they were in the past. They should not be, I feel, I am, I, you know, it is. It, that is in the present, we want these to be in the past. So these are some more examples. So if I wanted to say, you know, the to, to be with the cathedral, we'd say the cathedral was. Um, Brunicelli and Ghiberti were. Uh, the sculpture looked. You'll notice how if I am having a past tense agreement, you have that linking verb. Remember, the linking verb is the piece that connects to your predicate. It has to agree with what you're saying. If you're talking about something in the past, it has to agree with the linking verb. Okay? Okay, and we're going to talk about some prefixes that we could add to these words. So if we're talking about the word measurable, remember that's the root word, that's the main word, and we add the I-M prefix in, it's now immeasurable. Notice how that also changes the meaning of the word. So now it's the um, too large in size in the amount to be measured. So measurable means I can, add, if I were to pour, some, pour water into a cup, it's measurable. I know exactly what's in it. But if it's immeasurable, it means I cannot measure this item. And so notice how it changes that meaning. Mobile to immobile. If something's mobile, it moves. If it's immobile, it doesn't move. So just by adding that prefix, it's changing the meaning. Patient, impatient. Polite, impolite. Correct, incorrect. Definite, indefinite. Audible, inaudible. Complete, incomplete. A lot of these words you can even say, see are opposites. So that's kind of a nice way to think about it. That is the end of lesson two for today. We will see everyone in lesson three.